and welcome everyone to the next set of speakers. There, we have three of them in a set of lightning talks. They're going to talk about how to prepare your theme for Gutenberg. First up is Bill Erickson. Bill has been building web WordPress websites as a freelancer for 14 years. He's an entrepreneur, a husband, a father, and an avid reader living in Georgetown, Texas. Take it away, Bill. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, so it's been about 18 months since uh, Gutenberg was merged into WordPress core. And in that time, I've built about 40 websites that use Gutenberg as the primary content editing experience. Um, and I've learned a lot. Um, so I wanted to share some of the tips that um, we have to have a successful client project when building with Gutenberg. Um, and this talk's going to be a bit of an overview. It's not the best format for sharing code. So I wrote a post to go along with it uh, where you can find um, the code um, and more information on everything I'm talking about in here. Um, I'm going to use one of my recent client projects as an example throughout this presentation. Um, this is nextrep.com, and it's built 100% with Gutenberg. Um, and this is the home page, uh, all Gutenberg blocks, mostly uh, core blocks, but with some custom blocks as well. Um, and I think it's a real good example of uh, why we really enjoy using Gutenberg and the power it gives to our clients. Um, our goal is to uh, build engaging websites um, that look great, work well, um, but are really easy for non-technical content editors to maintain and retain a, a consistent style of guide throughout. Um, and the Gutenberg block editor allows us to do that a lot better than we could in the past. Um, so our first tip for having a successful Gutenberg project would be starting with atomic design. Um, so prior to uh, Gutenberg, the way we typically, or our team used to design things, it was more template-based. Um, so we'd start with the basic templates like single post, single page, archive, um, and then the more complicated pages that required more than just a simple text area would be built with custom templates. So um, pricing, team, about us, uh, homepage, those would all be custom templates that usually removed the editor and then used the meta box to manage all the content. Um, it worked better than TinyMCE for building complex pages, um, but it wasn't the best experience. Um, and two of the, the main issues that we had were um, the inability to like have a visual representation in the back end of your content edits. Um, so you'd have to publish and then go view them to see what actually changed. Um, and it wasn't as flexible as it could be because you're limited by whatever options we put into that meta box for you. Um, and so as you know, Gutenberg is a more modular content creation tool um, and it helps to use a more modular design approach with it to get the most value out of it. Um, so what we do nowadays is we start with um, an atomic design approach. So we start with the atoms, the smallest elements, which often correspond to core WordPress blocks. Um, so that's headings, paragraph, button, links. Um, from that, we build molecules, which are sort of like a higher level element that are made up of those atoms. These would be like post elements that have like a title and an excerpt category image. Um, and then another level above that would be like molecules that are made up of, of higher level things. So um, like a post listing, which would have a title um, and like three post summaries. Um, and so by using this uh, atomic design approach during the design stage, um, it makes it really easy for me to do the development because I style the core WordPress blocks and then all of the things we build on top of it are using those same elements. So we don't have a ton of unique like single page styles and unique markup on certain elements because everything is sort of built on these same core blocks in the design phase so that it applies directly over to the development. Um, the other component I mentioned earlier was <laughs> that it's important to have an editor that reflects accurately the, the front end display so that people can visualize how things are going to look. And we do that with editor styles. Um, so that video I showed you of the home page, this is what the editor looks like on the home page. Um, so it's a perfect representation, almost perfect, of what the, um, the front end looks like. And this allows the client to um, really see how things are going to look as they're editing things and adding new blocks. They don't have to publish it and then go view it to see what it is. They can actually see it in the content creation process. Um, and so this is accomplished with um, editor styles. Um, which uh, you would load a separate style sheet. Um, so you have your front end style sheet and then a separate editor style sheet. Um, and it really helps to use SAS for this. So rather than trying to maintain multiple um, style sheets, trying to keep them all in sync, 
you break your main style sheet up into partials um, and load some of those partials into the editor and more of them into the main style sheet. Um, so this is an example of uh, what our style sheets typically look like. Um, both the main and the editor styles start with the same core elements, like our base styles and blocks. Um, the editor gets an extra Gutenberg-specific partial for any Gutenberg-specific changes we need to make. Um, and then the main style sheet gets the things that aren't relevant in the editor, like site header, site footer, and archive. Um, we, we heavily use the color palette to, um, to make the, the website work uh, be on brand and within the, the, the desired style guide. Um, so the colors palette is typically used for uh, buttons and blocks. Um, so all the full width sections that we build on sites, those are group blocks with a background color. Um, and, uh, and we usually have at least a primary and secondary, sometimes a tertiary and quaternary color. Um, one little design tip that works really well for us is um, we have a light version alternative for every color. So there's primary and light primary, secondary and light secondary. Um, and then in our uh, CSS for the groups, um, we have, um, if it's like the, the darker one, like primary, it overrides the color styles of the elements within it to be white and the light one doesn't do that. And so that allows us to, um, the client doesn't have to worry about selecting the right colors and worrying about contrast. They make one choice, they set the background for the section and all the styles within it automatically adjust to work correctly. Um, we also um, leverage additional editor styles and scripts um, where possible um, or, or to add additional functionality that isn't doable with the standard editor styles. Um, so when you enqueue normal editor styles, um, WordPress automatically prepends them with um, styles to scope them to just the editor. So if you have styles for an H2, it'll be editor styles wrapper H2. This works great when you are um, trying to use the same CSS and the editor in the front end because um, you don't have to worry about scoping your styles. Um, but in some cases, it's useful to um, have CSS or JavaScript that is not scoped like that. And then you can, you can load your own scripts for that as well. Um, on this site and on most of the sites that we build, um, we have a, a content layout, which is for like more content-based text where it's like 768 pixels wide, um, easily read text. Um, and then we have a wider full width layout that is used more for landing page styles, like blocks that have columns and things. Um, and so in the back end, when the client changes between page layouts, um, we're using some JavaScript and CSS to automatically update the editor to, to reflect that new style. Um, this way they get a more accurate reflection in the back end of what it's gonna look like on the front end. And so that's an example of something that you can't really do with the normal editor styles and you have to enqueue your own um, editor um, styles to do that. Um, we also leverage block styles. So we'll take core blocks and add additional alternatives to them. Um, and the most common example would be a button. So um, you have like a standard button, and then in this case, we have the feature button, which is a little more uh, visually interesting and larger. Um, and you can see they, they both use the, uh, the color palette, so there's a primary and secondary color here. Um, we'll typically remove any uh, block styles that come from WordPress core that we're not actively leveraging. So the standard buttons include a bunch of styles that we don't necessarily want. So we'll remove those, we'll add the ones that we want, um, and then we'll often uh, remove additional blocks that aren't relevant to us as well. So um, you really have the power to customize the uh, WordPress editor to have just the elements you need um, and not the ones you don't. <clears throat> we also um, make heavy use of uh, custom blocks in the sites we build. Um, I'd say a typical project for us has uh, between 10 and 20 custom blocks on it. Um, this particular site had 13. Um, we are big fans of advanced custom fields um, and think it makes a lot of sense for, uh, for single-use client sites like this. Um, if I were to be building something that would be publicly distributed, like a plugin, um, I definitely think it should be built natively with React because um, it'll be leaner, it will leverage more of the core WordPress functionality, um, and it won't have any plugin dependencies. But when it comes to building a site specifically for a client, um, especially when a lot of the core block or the custom blocks we're building are intimately tied into design and functional 
features inside of the theme. It makes sense to just package them all together using ACF. Um, and so we, we build a lot of custom blocks, um, but we also try to keep the custom blocks as minimal as possible. <clears throat> so in this example, um, this whole area, while it could have been a block, um, we uh, made only the three columns with the icons the custom blocks. So um, as you'll see in this little video, um, the big area is actually a full width group block with a background color. And then there's a heading block, and then our custom block is in there built with ACF. Um, what this allows us to do is we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can leverage um, core WordPress functionality like background colors. I don't need to redo all of that inside of um, inside of ACF. I mean, it also gives the client more flexibility in case they want to add content after these icons or different type of content before it. So by keeping custom blocks as small and lean as possible, um, it makes the overall page building experience uh, more flexible. Finally, um, I think one of the most important things when it comes to building a website with Gutenberg is client training. Um, we find that most of our clients have never used Gutenberg before. Um, they are uh, using the classic editor plugin on their site to keep using the old editor. Um, and um, that, I think that actually makes a lot of sense. I think the best time to switch to Gutenberg is when you uh, are custom building a theme that is designed specifically for Gutenberg. Um, you really get to take advantage of all the features in Gutenberg if your theme was built specifically for it. Um, and so the downside to this is um, in the past, when um, we were building a new theme for a client, um, they already knew WordPress. We're just sort of adding a new skin on top of it. Now, when we're giving a new site to a client, it's basically giving them a brand new CMS. It's something they're not familiar with, they've never used. Um, and so training becomes even more important. Um, we leverage uh, WP101 for this. Uh, they have a plugin that you can install on all your client sites. Um, they provide great video tutorials that walk through WordPress core and a lot of Gutenberg in there as well. Um, there's also the ability to create your own custom videos for clients. And so all of the custom blocks that we build and a lot of the unique special features that they need to know for their site, we'll build those as custom videos so that they can review them once and then they can review them all the time. Like as they're editing content six months, 12 months from now, these videos will always be available. Um, and we found that, especially with Gutenberg, because it's so um, visual and interactive and there's a lot of sort of hidden functionality, um, it can take a really long time to learn all the tips and tricks and the tools you need if someone doesn't sit down and show it to you. Um, and so these video tutorials help um, accelerate the learning curve for our clients and get them more comfortable with um, the Gutenberg block editor. So um, I would highly recommend you plan for training, um, especially visual, um, so videos or phone-based training where you're doing screen sharing um, so that they can become more familiar with these tools and what you've built for them. Um, so that's it. Um, that's my talk. Um, and uh, please stick around for the Q&A afterwards and please ask me any of the questions you have. Thank you. Ellen Bauer is a front-end developer at Elma Studio and has been working with WordPress since 2009. She loves open source, is married to her business partner, and a happy vegan living in New Zealand. Here she is, Ellen Bauer. Hi, this is Ellen. Um, I'm front-end developer and blogger and lots of things, support person and um, everything in between at Emma Studio. We have a little theme shop. My husband Manu and I, we are working um, with WordPress and building themes since 2011, 2012. And um, yeah, we prepared all our current themes for Gutenberg when it came out and supporting these themes. And in the last month, we also built a new free theme, uh, which is called I know and it's um, hopefully be um, available in the WordPress org directory very soon. And we also built um, some custom Gutenberg blocks um, for this theme to work together with the theme. Um, so yeah, we've done a lot of uh, work with Gutenberg and we really love it. And I hope I can um, give you some insights and helpful tips uh, to build with Gutenberg blocks as well. You can find me on Twitter uh, at Ellen Bauer or uh, what my WordPress org profile is Elma Studio. Our website is almastudio.de uh, slash den for the English version. So um, today I um, prepared a little bit of um, tips and um, some insights we've learned 
on how to prepare a theme for Gutenberg. So yeah, let's just dive into it and get started. So um, yeah, how to start? It's overwhelming. We have all this new information and we've been building themes and designs for WordPress in one way for a very long time. And now this is all changing. And I know it's a little bit frustrating and can be overwhelming to um, actually know uh, how to do all this and how to keep up to date with everything. So uh, my tips to get started are first, the most important resource is the blog editor handbook and especially the page on theme support there. Uh, there you find all the snippets um, you can add to your functions PHP theme file um, to get started on supporting um, blogs and um, it's always development uh, developing so there are new snippets being added and new explanations and um, now there's also an experimental additional thing you see in the uh, sidebar there it's uh, for blog based themes um, so you can follow the developments there as again the most important thing at the moment is just keep up to date with all the new developments and not get overwhelmed by them, but actually get excited. And I hope you will. So um, just a few things um, to get started. Um, you can um, first then uh, download the theme unit test file, the XML file, the a theme review team um, created. And this is cool because then you have all the uh, posts with um, the default core blocks um, installed and you can test them and their style variations in your local environment. So this is the next step uh, you should do. And um, to follow the new updates and newer development, as I mentioned, like block based themes, the theme shaper block has um, some new cool tutorials um, that came out and just explanations on these new developments. So block based themes is a newer post and also global styles, which is going to be very important to follow along for everyone who's building themes or designs for WordPress, because this is going to be very uh, important for us. Um, we're going to get a global style sheet um, we can create and prepare in our themes and users can use and customize that and the styles there instead of having all the customizer options we have now. So it's super important to follow these tutorials. Then always, um, uh, for me, this is always the thing um, I like how I learn is just look at how other themes um building and what they are doing. Look at the 2020 theme or the new Go theme the uh, Coblox team has created and just install the theme and look at their code and follow um, along, see how they structure their files and how they build stuff in their functions file and just um, or in their CSS file, how they support all the core blocks and what they are doing. So yeah, just look at the code as much as you can and learn and try things out and look what others are doing. You can also look at our Aino theme, uh, which I have installed now here in my screenshot and uh, maybe the atomic blocks themes um, for the atomic blocks. So just look at other people, how they have created and um, just try out from there. So now a few snippets from the theme support page and how to pimp your theme and how to get started. Just a few, um, as I said, uh, just look at the um, theme support page on a regular basis because it gets updated. So the first thing you want to do is um, if you want to support editor styles, you just need one line of code, just add theme support editor styles and you have support for the like block editor styles. And um, if you want to then add your own CSS to that um, for your blog support, then you can enqueue the add editor style and add your own CSS file there and um, just include all your CSS for your own editor styles for the blocks you support there. So these two lines are very important for the beginning. And then the next thing I always do for all themes is to support wide and full width alignment because this is just a very cool feature. And if I include just one, um, this one snippet of code at theme support align wide, um, I get the support for wide um, 
and full width alignments for all the core blocks that um, support this option here. In my example, I use the image block. So this is just this one line of code. And then in your CSS, you need to actually include the pixel sizes of your default uh, width, um, column width, your wide align width, and your full align width. So this is the maximum width in the CSS you need to include. Then another cool thing you can do is you can make a preset of um, font sizes for your paragraph um, fonts and um, you can have a whole collection. This is in our Ino theme. We added <laughs> all the font sizes we could. And the cool thing there is you can use the editor font sizes um, at theme support um, snippet again in your functions PHP file and then um, use the arrays to add your own fonts. And in our example, um, I deactivated completely custom fonts because um, I didn't like that they are not responsive then, but all the font sizes I create, I get a custom CSS um, class then, and I can make them responsive, which is especially helpful for the bigger font sizes. So you need to check on that. Um, you find all the snippets to deactivate certain features on the theme support page as well. So um, you can check out the snippets there. Then another cool thing is um, a custom color palette. We went pretty simple in our Ino theme. We just um, make a, a color for the primary, for our primary color, for our two text colors, a border color and backgrounds. And the code for that is just add theme support for editor color palette and then you can add your um, colors there and you can support the at the moment if you have uh, customizer options for your primary color for instance you can uh, support them so this color if someone changes it in the customizer re will re be reflected in your color palette which is super helpful I think. Um, Something new you can add now is next to solid colors, you can add gradients. And in our Aino theme, we went a little bit overboard with that because we just had a lot of fun with the gradients. And as for the colors, um, the palettes will just automatically be added to all the core blocks who support gradients or solid colors. So here, for instance, in my example, I used the cover block but the gradients are also added to the core buttons block and I think group block. So um, we pre-made the code for the gradients and you can add the snippet at theme support editor gradient presets. And again, this is, um, you can just copy paste this in your, uh, from the theme support page. And then we added all the CSS for the gradients we wanted to support. And then um, people can customize them uh, in quite some detail. It's a nice new feature in the blocks edit, um, like in the inspector. And um, but since it's a little bit more advanced to create gradients, we just built um, quite a bunch of them and had fun. And people can just use them in your theme then. So the next question, you have all the snippets for uh, support in your theme is then, okay, which blocks do I actually support in my theme? And um, of course, the main blocks you want to support are all the core blocks. And there it's important to just follow new developments because new blocks are being added all the time. And you can test newer blocks that are not in core yet, but are already in the Gutenberg plugin. So you can um, always test the blocks in the plugin. And then uh, maybe you want to have um, support for the book, uh, WooCommerce blocks. If you have a WooCommerce ready theme, you want to um, keep up with the developments in the Jetpack plugin uh, and support maybe Jetpack blocks. If this is something your users um, like to use, uh, there is a form block which is very helpful or you can just use um, the block of one of the bigger form plugins and support that and um, you can also support uh, maybe a block collection plugin you can choose one you really um, think is helpful for the designs you want to build and um, support one of the block collection plugins or you can 
go a little bit crazy and maybe look into building your own blogs. Uh, this doesn't have to be a big collection plugin. Maybe you just want to build one, two or three single blogs. Uh, so um, this is actually what we are doing with our Aino theme at the moment uh, because we just wanted to have all the control to create the designs we really wanted um, to have. And then we just thought, oh, we just built our own blocks. So you can also look into that if you if you like. I think it's, um, it is a little bit difficult in the beginning from a theme, theme um, creator developer perspective. But it, if you like do it... Um, more regular and just don't give up in the beginning i think it's actually a lot of fun and not too um, complex to build your own blog so maybe uh, don't give up too soon i think then one cool feature which is um, more simple than creating your own blogs is to create style variations for blogs and um, for core blogs or for plugin blogs um, so there is a cool tutorial on this on the theme shaper block but what it looks like is you have a block and then in the inspector you get the style variations and you can in your theme simply add your own uh, here in my example I use the button block for I know and then we have at the moment four styles for the button but we will add more and it's um, actually pretty simple and you have the tutorial here and you have also code snippets on the theme support page in the blog editor handbook and it's very easy and then you have your custom styles and you can just add CSS for those styles. You can do that with every blog available and it's a pretty cool feature to simply um, have a lot of custom options for blogs um, just in your theme. You can add them in the theme or in a plugin but it's cool that you can add them in just in your theme as well. I know it's um, a lot to learn at the moment and a lot to keep up with and it is overwhelming I have to admit and I think um, we just need to read more and research more and ask more questions and um, we shouldn't forget that all these new developments, uh, the block developments, Gutenberg developments are just created as a tool for us creators to um, build cool things with WordPress, to build cool designs for WordPress and uh, get users excited to use our work. So um, I think just um, with the block-based themes, block patterns and global styles, full site editing, um, looking into React, CSS grid and stuff, it is a lot. So um, I just want to give you a little list of things that I follow um, to make sure I stay on track of things and keep up to date. So um, the first thing you should do is have the Gutenberg plugin installed in your local uh, test environment and work with the plugin always. And there you see all the new developments. There are quite a lot of updates for the plugin. So um, to make sure you have an overview of what's uh, new in the plugin, uh, you can read the Make WordPress Gutenberg updates on the Make um, WordPress site and keep up to date there. If you don't want to read all of them, you can also listen to the Gutenberg Changelog podcast, which Birgit and uh, Mark are doing. And it's super cool because you can just um, get a cup of tea or coffee, relax, and just listen to the podcast. They're doing an amazing job of bringing all the updates uh, right to us. Then uh, also join the Slack channels, the WordPress Slack channels, the theme review channel, the design channel, the core channel and just ask questions there, join the meetups, follow the discussions there and also um, maybe look into the Gutenberg plugin on GitHub and just get more familiar with the codes, um, look what actual blocks are there and uh, what they are working on, what's getting added and look at the issues maybe and just participate and ask questions there and give feedback. I think this is um, also very important. And then um, just in the uh, as a giveaway, I think it's um, super important that we stay excited or get excited to create, to be creative, not be overwhelmed by all the technical hurdles or new things we need to learn for us and in our Elma Studio. 
um, little bubble, the most important thing was for us to uh, look at our niche or find a niche, just um, look at what we want to create with uh, WordPress and blogs and how we can do that in a simple way and in the best way for our customers. Uh, remember what the customers or the theme users you have really like about your work and just um, build on top of that and uh, make it simple in the beginning and just be excited to create new things like blog patterns and just make it more easy in the end for users to create cool websites um, for them in WordPress. So I think it's important to just stay excited and focus on the outcome, the front end, um, because this is what people are actually in the end using and loving about WordPress and um, just keep on track on all the new developments and don't get frustrated. And I think um, the just as a takeaway, the most helpful skills I will be focusing in the upcoming month are learning more React and JavaScript. And this is just by looking at the Gutenberg uh, blocks, how they are built, how other uh, maybe block collection plugins are built and just trying out to build super simple uh, blocks. There are a few cool tutorials out there for that. For instance, uh, the Zach Gordon's courses are super helpful, help me a lot to get into it. And then also CSS Grid and CSS Variables are super exciting for theme developers at the moment to uh, try out and try to use in our themes. So uh, these are the things I will be focusing in the upcoming weeks and month. So thanks so much for listening to my talk. I hope it was helpful and please ask me any questions you have. Let's connect online. And please stay safe, stay at home, and uh, let's hope we can soon meet up in person again all. Um, thanks so much. Beth Soderberg is an independent developer and a digital communication strategist based out of Alexandria, Virginia. She is also a co-organizer of WordCamp DC and the WordPress DC Meetup, and has contributed to the WordPress training team. Passing it to you, Beth. All right, thank you, Mark. So this case study is about how to update your starter theme for Gutenberg. So first, we're going to talk about the very basics. What is a starter or quote base theme? WordPress people use starter theme, Drupal people use base theme, they mean the same thing. The starter, a starter theme is a theme that has all of the components to build a custom or bespoke theme, but that is completely pared down. You should be able to build any website from your starter theme, and it should be, frankly, super ugly when you enable it on a website. So think the internet about 1996. There should be nothing special looking about it. It should have none, no or minimal styling, and it should really only include the most basic default styling and spacing. What you're doing is establishing a default code base that enables you to move more quickly. So you would use one, to be more efficient in your processes. It's more efficient to use a starter theme than a child theme from a code perspective because you're not overriding things all the time. And you're also automating your default setup. So this is including standard WordPress templating, but also things like preferred SAS mixins and template structures and all of that fun stuff. When you're using a common base for your starter theme, you're also getting built-in best practices and expertise from the community at the core of your theme. And then you have a common starting point to work from that makes finding and getting help easier. You should never be working completely in a silo. Just building your own from complete scratch is also going to lead to massive confusion for anyone who inherits your work later. So how would you build one? We're gonna talk about rebuilding one, but first, how would you start, right? Um, again, in short, don't roll your own completely. Use something that's well known and publicly available as a base so that you do get those in benefits of community input and support. For this, the purposes of this case study, we're going to talk about my base theme and my process of iterate, iterating on it over time. So the history of my theming practices is that I started when I very first learned how to build a WordPress site, I started with Genesis. 
which is still around and it's a very popular framework. But in about 2010, it was very, very popular and it was an easier way for me to learn how to code and how to code in WordPress specifically. Then I moved to child theming off of the 2012 standard theme. And I built a lot of websites that way. Eventually I got sick of it. And because I was getting tired of overriding things, which is, you know, classic child theming. So that's when I started to think about building my own base theme. So my very first was base theme was in 2016. And my goal was very simple. It was a default to work from. And I used underscores, which was very popular at the time. It's still pretty popular. Why did I use it? I'd heard about it. I knew who a lot of the people were who had built it. And it was being updated pretty consistently at that time. And I really didn't know what I was doing other than the fact that I knew that I needed to shift and I knew that 2012 had been based off of underscores. So the code was related. In 2019 was when I first rebuilt my starter theme for, to be Gutenberg compatible. And my original goal there was simply create something that was basically identical to what I had, but functional in Gutenberg. Now, and, and my starter theme choice in 2019 shifted to be the Gutenberg starter theme, which is a fork of underscores. And the reason I did this was because I started to modify my existing theme. So the one that I had built in 2016, and I spent about 30 minutes trying to do it. And I got really, really, really frustrated and realized that a lot of people had already done all of the work that I was trying to do and solved a lot of the problems that I was trying to figure out. So I restarted with the Gutenberg starter theme and basically ported back into it the things that I wanted from my original 2016 theme and then shifted other things that were new in the, from the Gutenberg starter theme based on my preferences and what and how I thought I should be set up. So why the shift from underscores? Basically theme evolution. A lot of my choices have been based on this over time. The predecessors to underscores include a lot of really classic themes in WordPress history and lessons from all of those have found their way into underscores. 2012 conveniently, like I said, was that I was using for so long was the first core theme release that was based on underscores. So there was a lot of familiar, familiarity in the structure for me and that, that structure has maintained over time, which only makes me more efficient in how I'm building. The code is also feeding into itself by, by staying within the you know, proverbial family. And so I'm also creating systems that another developer might look at and say, oh, I've seen this before because all of these themes are related in some way and a lot of the decisions are the same theme to theme. In 2020, I'm rebuilding it again. So this is what I'm working on right now. And my goal now is that I've used this theme for about six to eight months. I think that I finished my first version of the new base theme in August of 2019. My goal now is to really refactor that based on what I've learned since, create an ideal workflow and theme structures that are based on what I've learned to be true about building websites in Gutenberg, just from my experiential evidence, and also from best practices and things I've learned from other folks in the community as more people are writing about it, more people are talking about it, and more people are sharing what they're doing. So to start, there are some non-Gutenberg template structure decisions that you need to make when you build a starter theme. So you need to decide what your defaults are gonna be for your template files. For example, over time I've added frontpage.php as part of my starter theme because I add it to every single site. 
And in general, the rule of thumb should be, if this is a thing that you do to every single website that you build, it should be in your starter theme. <laughs> and you know that's the basic criteria for entry. Make sure that your page component templates make sense. So I've actually removed sidebar.php completely because most of the themes that I build don't use it at this point. Sometimes I have to add it back and that's okay, but most of the time I don't. And then template parts are the same. So when I added frontpage.php, I added a template partial called contenthome.php to correspond. Always take a look at your includes folder, make sure that what's there is what you wanna be there. I always end up ripping stuff out. For example, I don't really use Jetpack. So I take anything Jetpack related out of there that comes with the bases that I'm using, either underscores or the Gutenberg starter theme. And then also remove unnecessary administrative files. Um, you don't need them. Look for anything that you're not using and just take it out and make sure you're also taking out the references to those things in functions.php. Non-Gutenberg styling decisions. So this includes deciding what unit of measure you're using. Both underscores and the Gutenberg starter theme use M's, I use REMs. I have to rewrite all of it so that it's consistent. You don't wanna be mixing those two things together. You can either use vanilla CSS or a preprocessor. I use SAS. So I also have a whole structure and naming convention that I use to organize that. A lot of which is actually based in Drupal themes that I used to work in. And then you need to pick a method, method for compiling if you are using a preprocessor. I'm currently using Compass, but I'm going to be moving to Gulp. Other important non-Gutenberg decisions, modifying your text and content defaults, making sure you have a logical git ignore. There is no reason for your entire SAS cache history to be in git. Implement linting tools. I've started using Travis CI, which is awesome, uh, to make sure that my code is all up to snuff. So um, there's other stuff too, but make sure you're also iterating and fixing the things that annoy you over time. So for me, this is things like, I don't like where the Gutenberg starter theme images directory is located. So I've moved it. And that's a very personal preference. And it doesn't really matter where your images directory is, but it makes you faster. And if it's something you're changing every time, you should just do it. So what do I need to do to make my theme Gutenberg compatible? First, you need to make sure you have default CSS for all of your Gutenberg blocks. So, you know, this is the list of blocks, block styling that comes with the Gutenberg starter theme. And what I recommend is going through and, you know, testing out each one using the test unit data and making sure that the defaults that are there are what work for you and how you think about styling. Because if the philosophy behind how it's formatting doesn't fit with how you actually build a site, you're gonna end up going back and doing hacky things later. Um, overall, you should also be looking for old CSS patterns that no longer work. For example, this is a new version of my width mix-in. And this is because my old version relied heavily on padding instead of margin. And the padding with Gutenberg blocks, in fact, especially with full width blocks, was messing up the internal container in really sort of ugly ways. And I learned that by moving similar ideas to use margin, you actually could maintain a functional width mix-in and have it to be continued to comp be compatible with the blocks. So making adjustments like that as you go and you're experimenting with how to build in this new way. You need to expand theme support. So adding core block visual style support to output your core block styles, adding full and wide image alignment support. This is something that you cannot have if you don't want your theme to support it, but it's one of the, the cooler things in Gutenberg in terms of my, in my opinion. So, but this is also one of the pain points for refactoring an existing site or existing code. And it part of why I ditched my old underscores based theme because it was just a pain <laughs> to try and make sure all of the width pieces were working properly within the containers that weren't really intended to hold Gutenberg blocks. 
you need to add color palette defaults. So this is theme support for when you go into the Gutenberg editor and there's the color palette on the side. You should be specifying the colors based on the branding of your client and the theme of their website. I have two colors that I'm showing here, primary and secondary. I recommend naming them something generic so that you can reuse them and not have to change the names to purple or orange or whatever for every theme you're building. Um, I also have accent white and dark in my current starter theme. Once you do that, you need to add the CSS that defines that color palette. And that way, when someone selects one of those colors in your editor, it will actually show up in the UI and also on the front of the website. Well, give me a second on the UI. All right. Similarly, you need to add block font size defaults and the corresponding CSS so that when someone chooses font size small in the editor, something actually happens. I am a big believer in preventing editor independence. I think this is important when you're trying to maintain the fidelity of the design look and feel. This is adding theme support to disable custom colors. So you're preventing them from picking the whole rainbow option, which is really good most of the time. And you can also disable custom font sizes. So if you're trying to create a design system where your users are not picking 15 different sizes for their fonts, this is for you. Because I know some folks are, are likely to go rogue when they're trying to make a, a quote special page. Also, you need to add support for editor styling. So this is the piece of Gutenberg that makes the styling of the editor experience match the front end styling of the website. So you've got to add style editor.css to the root of your theme and write styles that customize that experience. If you are using SAS, one of the big benefits of using a preprocessor is that you can use your partial structure to pull into your style editor style sheet, which reduces the amount of work you have to do over time by a whole lot. So once you quote Gutenbergize your theme, what's next, right? First, you should use it and then modify it and then use it and then modify it. <laughs> Monitoring and adjusting is based on what you're learning by doing and based on what you're learning from the ecosystem in terms of best practices is really going to be what makes your theme work for you over time. Your, your theme shouldn't be static, it should always be iterative. You should be version controlling your work with Git because that way when you run into something later, and you're like, this doesn't actually work. What was I thinking? You can go back and figure out where it came from and when, when it started and figure out how to move back appropriately or otherwise shift. You sh this should be in your own separate repo. You should be downloading a new copy for your projects every time you have a new one. And then keep notes on your plan changes. I have a document where I keep track of my ideas because frequently I don't have time to implement them when I'm actually thinking of them because that's usually happening while I'm, while I'm working on a real project. These ideas can be very specific, like I want to remove the blocks.css styling into my SAS partials and rewrite a lot of those defaults because the ones that come from the Gutenberg starter theme drive me nuts. I really don't like a lot of them. <laughs> and so I need to shift them around to work with how I actually work. And then in more general ideas, I'd like to create a custom starter plugin to complement my custom starter theme. Monitor your original base for interesting updates. The Gutenberg starter theme added theme options after I first forked and built my starter theme. So I haven't decided whether I will implement it or not yet for mine, but I know it's there and I know I can go grab it if I need it. Again, monitor the Gutenberg plugin, the word, make WordPress blogs and core release notes to figure out what you're gonna need in the future and to start planning and to make sure that you're adapting quickly when things do change. Because as we all know, this is an ever evolving system. And then monitor specific Gutenberg ideas that you have. So one question I've been mulling for a while is, do I need a starter JS slash editor JS file, right? These are, this example is of buttons that I built for a project. And I thought when I did it, that I was going to be building buttons like this a lot. And I might, 
but I still haven't quite figured out what the like essentialized version of this would be that would make sense to put in a base theme. Don't forget to evaluate the non-Gutenberg stuff too, especially CSS is moving very quickly right now and modernizing very quickly. So as things become truly usable in terms of Flexbox and such, make sure you're making appropriate changes based on that. And then lastly, pay attention to how you and your team works. This is all about making things easier for you to do your own custom development that really does work with Gutenberg. So pay attention to your team, pay attention to the things that do and do not work and don't be afraid to adjust accordingly. And overarchingly, don't overdo it. This is the base. It's supposed to be the most default thing you could possibly have. So keep everything you're doing very simple and make sure to essentialize as you go. And that is it. Thank you very much for your time. Beth, thank you so much. That was very informative. I really enjoyed watching some of the tricks that you do with those themes. So if you all have any questions for us, please list them out and we'd be happy to address them. Uh, as mentioned before, though, Ellen Bauer is with me, front end developer at Elma Studio. Thank you for joining me, Ellen. Thanks, no worries. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> so you're you're talking to us from New Zealand, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> and wow. as you can see, um, I'm in my car improvising because our Wi-Fi is pretty on and off. So I was happy to pre-record my talk, actually. Otherwise, in the daytime, because everyone is at home. The Wi-Fi is pretty bad. Sure. But it's sure. good I, now, I hope. It is right now. You're very clear. So thank, <laughs> you. thank you for taking that stroll in your car and finding some suitable Wi-Fi to join me. Yes, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> so being in New Zealand, I know that there have been some recent a uh, recent starting of some block-based theme meetings going on in the community in the in Slack. Have I know in New Zealand, you, it's probably not the best time for you to make it. Have you been able to uh, see what's going on with those? Yeah, I think it, unfortunately they changed the times a little bit, and I tried to follow. Unfortunately, it's like in the middle of the night, so I wasn't able to follow them live until now. I maybe have to like get a midnight snack or something and follow. I wish I could. And I'd like read the, the meetups um, conversations later because I think it's super interesting. Yeah, maybe actually I, I tried it like one or two times, but it didn't make it yet. But I want to actually, um, that's a good encouragement. I should, um, we should join them. Oh, no, I don't mean to encourage you to wake up at midnight <laughs> to join a meeting. <laughs> don't take me wrong. I think just following along, though, has really, uh, really been interesting. I know they've had a lot of discussions. Really, um, there's a lot of uh, care that goes into these themes and building things and really trying to make sure that the future of themes is uh, something that's very stable and um, and that really accepts contributors to to build uh, and your experiences with you your experience building these themes has been uh in gutenberg or using gutenberg has been a positive one uh it it's a challenge because things are changing so fast like new developments are coming up and i think especially the last year the beginning of last year was a little bit like um we're kind of, it felt like we're swimming in water somehow, not really knowing where things would go or how sh we should approach things. But I think now, um, and then what we did actually um, for us was just build a basic, um, a basic theme. And then we invested into building our own blocks for that theme to, to work together and spent kind of last year doing that and learning to build blocks. And now I think with um, stuff like general styles and block patterns and um, more thoughts coming like how what kind of role themes playing it's coming kind of back together which I think is super exciting and the concept of like how block based themes should look and all these thoughts I think it's getting more and more or becoming more and more clear how um, how things will actually work and that themes still have a role to play and and we always thought that but more as like a like a design style sheet. And then, because when we started um, creating our first blocks, I like it's pretty soon realized you can't go with 
just the blogs. You need like a design style guide, just the general like general styles the, to go below because otherwise you're just repeating your work. Like you need to have the general style somewhere. And I think this is great for themes to be the place um, for that. Like you don't want to have um, make your font adjustments or like choose your font in every single block. That just doesn't make sense right. to have the font settings in every single block. There needs to be a general place or like general colors and stuff um, to choose ones and then apply these cho like chosen settings for from users onto the blocks. Excellent. I, I yeah I think those um, having global styles is really key. I'm going to actually still see that um, Bill has joined us here. Yeah, I think so. Let's see if I could get him in as well. Yeah, and, and again, I think for people who build themes for uh, <laughs> for <Hi>. customers <laughs> like Bill, it's it's a different approach again with like custom blogs and. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting I, to see. How, how have uh, so you the the prospect of global styles coming into Gutenberg into the block editor bill has that been something that you've been really uh, getting excited about for your themes and how you build for your clients? Uh, potentially, um, I'm looking forward to seeing how it's actually implemented and seeing because I mean we we are doing global styles through our own custom style sheets like. Basically, what it's bringing is the tools to do what we do through our design and development process to a wider audience by lowering the barriers to do it. Um, and so I'm interested to see how it's implemented to make sure that it works well with what we do um, and doesn't just end up overriding a bunch of what we do and they like change the line height on a bunch of the things that we had already set up. So mm -hmm. the devil's going to be in the details, but um, I like the direction. Um, and but I do think it's going to be a tool more for the uh, like the DIY builders who don't have a designer developer like custom building things for them. Um, and so um, I, I think it's it's going to help the broader audience for WordPress more. And I'm not exactly sure how it's going to work for me particularly. So I want to test both of you, and maybe maybe it's not the best test. But were, did either of you watch Tammy Lister's talk today about global styles? I think I caught a little bit of it. A little bit. And Ellen, it might have been at a bad time for you. Yeah, me too. It was the morning. But I yeah. did. And I, I I, just said to other people, too, we're going to watch. Um, Manu and I got just going to watch over the weekend all the talks we missed overnight. We were sleeping through, through <laughs> half of the event. <laughs> She she showed in her uh, talk about a le level of like hierarchy or cascading the way these styles work with global styles. And so you have, I, I can't quite think of the pyramid exactly at the top of my head, but um, it was something like the base styles were the editor styles. And then on top of that, you had like the theme styles that would affect the entire, all the pages. And then on top of that, maybe the global styles, if the user made some global style changes. And then on top of that, you had like block styles, right? That were very specific to that block. And so cool. having sort of that stacking or cascading way that styles work, does that, uh, how does that make you feel as building themes for clients? Do you feel like that? That seems to be a pretty logical flow or is there other, do you have other ideas on how something like that works? Yeah, um, I, I think it's, like I said, an interesting approach and I'm looking forward to see how it works. I just hope it doesn't become like more and more specific styles and so you end up with these like huge style chains mm -hmm. to try and override things at different points. Um, and so um, as long as there's a way to cleanly um, build your theme styles in a way that you don't have to like chain off a ton of things. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see wh where it goes. Um, and that's, that's a delicate line, uh, where, where, where things should be styled by the theme versus the block versus global styles. And so I think it just needs to be flushed out and like community guidelines set up. So like, we're all sort of building it in the same way, similar to how like theme colors, like it, it works much better in your theme if you call things primary and secondary because then when you change themes that carries over as opposed to something that's more um, specific like blue or green. And so I have a feeling that when it comes to these sort of cascading styles, it'll work really well if everyone's sort of following the same playbook 
Um, and once the, the ground has been set, we'll, we'll find the right path through it. I think you're right there. Yeah, yeah I, I think, I think so too. Yeah, bring, bringing like everybody on board with the similar framework or a similar like concept on how to style their sites or style their themes um, is really important, I think, for the whole ecosystem to to, con to conform to that kind of common way that makes it easier then for the user, right? Or the, the website builder to be able to switch out themes or switch out some CSS and it, and it becomes a little more natural, I think. Does that seem right? I yeah. Think, yeah, especially for users, um, because it is a little bit confusing at the moment, like blocks work very differently and themes still work, like some are built in the older way, some are adapting new concepts. It's, I think for the users at the moment, it's pretty confusing. So that would be a great approach to to make things more, like so they work for everyone in the same way. I think that too. I, have you um, have you noticed that there's been a lot of um, a lot of PRs and Goop and GitHub being merged in that are kind of labeled as a lighter DOM. Uh, it's a lot of work that's happening to make the blocks easier for themes to style and just like lighten up on some of the uh, the HTML elements and on the classes that are being used within the editor itself. So that way, theme developers can come in and really uh, take control a little easier. Have, have you seen any of those coming through or have you experienced that some of the new versions of Gutenberg are making it a little easier? Yeah, I think especially the last like one or two updates, um, I've really seen a difference, especially now with the new styles. It's, I love it a lot. Like we think that's uh, very great. And yeah, definitely it was like a hard job. It was not fun to try to style. And actually at right. one point last year, I, I kind of decided to to wait on that, to focus on the front end and just wait because I, I kind of felt like, okay, this is changing a lot, the editor styles. So I just leave it. It doesn't look pretty, but it's working. Focus on the front end to get that great. And then now I, I think we can start more to really get the editor look the same way as the front end because I felt it was still pretty much a lot in development. So yeah, we definitely noticed that and I love it. I think it's a great idea um, in concept to lower the DOM elements and decrease the specificity of the markup that's being used currently. But you also have to be very careful. Like once it's been pushed out in core, everyone's been building on top of what's there. Um, and so like what we do is when we build the site, we make the back end match the front end. Uh, but six months from now, if they've changed a bunch of DOM elements, it could have negative effects on styles we've already done. And so um, I think they're, WordPress core is really good about backwards compatibility and not making breaking changes and testing all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I think a lot more of the thought um, is going to be done for new elements going in and making sure they're doing it as clean and minimal as possible because you can't change the markup too much for things that have already been in there because it'll negatively affect things that people have already built on top of it. Hmm. Great point about that backward compatibility. I know that is definitely a big concern for the core team and the Gutenberg teams. Good points. Uh, I have a few questions here. I'm looking through our questions. So what's, how, how about this one? What's the one thing you wish core would make easier for themes in the future? Um, one thing I would really like um, would be a way to uh, for this theme to specify like the level of customization you want made available because it's one thing like we remove custom color picker and then the custom font size slider, um, but then three six months later they add a gradient tool. It's like I'd like to be able to opt out of the sort of designer buildery things that we have already like thought of in a different way. It's like our theme is handling this for you. You don't need that. I'd like to be able to sort of like opt in advance, say, these are all the features. Like I don't need those builder tools, those layout tools. I don't need them to be able to drag the columns and, and dynamically change widths and stuff. We want to stick to our core style guide. Um, because right now they give you the ability to do that, but it's like on a feature by feature basis. And I can't predict what those features are going to be in the future. 
Oh, that's, that's very interesting to hear because it's a, like a customer based perspective. We, we take a little bit of a different approach to, to stay uh, like to stick to core because we build like general themes for users, um, or especially one theme. So for us, it's more like looking what, what core is doing. And I wish um, that, but it's then again, not good for customer built themes because from my perspective, I wish that there would be like, it would be more general that like people couldn't do a lot of custom things that it all would work the same way. So if new users come to WordPress, they just kind of know it doesn't matter which theme they use, which block collection they use or which blocks, it just works the same way. Because for users, like for beginner users that come to us, like looking for a theme, this is always the biggest thing. They're so confused that in every kind of system, it works a little different. I think that's one part is the good part about WordPress and then in the other way, it's confusing and more, makes things more difficult for beginners. With good and bad at the same time, I guess. Very, very interesting. In fact, uh, Beth has just joined us as well. So I'd love to bring her. <laughs> cool. up. Well, that means, let's see. There we go. Doing this all live for everyone to watch. So interesting that we all build themes, but like for a different user base and very differently. I think that's pretty cool. Hey, Beth. Hi, I relocated. Excellent. That's <laughs> so perfect. I didn't realize this was happening because we weren't going to do it, but now we are. So yeah. I know, right? Oh, uh, when technical difficulties happen, we just go with the flow. And you, all three of you, have been fantastic <laughs> about this. So thank you for that time coming back on. Sure thing. It looks so, comfy on your couch. <laughs> yeah, it's. I'm actually at a beach house right now, so it's very tropical. Nice. Cool. So we were. I was working my way through some of the questions here, Beth. Um, let's see. I have one from Jessica. For template files, where we just want to list out posts and not have the client interact with the content, is that okay? Or would we ideally want to display those pages in block form on the admin side? I think it can be okay. I think it depends on who your end client is and what they're going to want to do. Hmm. And I think it also depends on where you want to put that in the middle of your page. So, for example, if you'd want to output something from a query at the bottom above your footer, so you can have block editor, editor stuff above it, and then your query, and then the footer, structurally, like, fine. But if you want to stick it in the middle of your blocks, <laughs> you know, like, there just starts to be logistical problems there. So I think that the, there's multiple pieces to that in terms of you know feasibility, but also whether or not it really makes sense for your end user. And I've, I've had so far one instance where I did that because you know the client wanted something fast. And they were like, eh, we're never gonna change that. And now we're moving the feed of posts or whatever it is into a block because they've changed their mind and they want to move it. <laughs> so it, they've gotten the idea of the block editor wasn't really fully formed in their brain when we made the initial decision because they couldn't conceptualize it yet. And now that they've been using it for four or five months now, they've gotten so into it that they're frustrated about the things they can't move, which is also interesting. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I've been, um, I work with a lot of publishers like food bloggers and other publishers. And so one of the things that we've been doing is bringing the block editor to their category pages to turn their category pages into like a landing page style, like their homepage. Um, and so I try and um, use the core like WordPress queries when possible. So if, if it's for your category of main dishes, or whatever, it should be on slash category slash main dishes. Um, but then we give them the ability to insert blocks above 
um, that area so they can like do some SEO friendly content, maybe list three popular posts in this section and then get into the main post. Um, or on some of them, we create a like main query block. And so they can like build out the content of the page and say, this is where the main query for the page should be. And so it has some blocks above, some blocks below. And so we sort of blur the lines on the editing perspective so that they have the block editor for all comp like for standard pages, but also for these dynamic archives, they have them there too. Um, but still working within the confines of WordPress where this is a category archive, this is the main query, um, and sort of trying to find the balance there so that they can have the control they want while also following best standards and not having like your category archive and then a page that has the exact same post listings. Like one, one of the uh, interesting questions that have popped up today was concerning um, kind of the idea of global styles I'm kind of talking about again here, that there was a concern that global styles really gave uh, too much freedom for the client or the user. Um, do you all kind of see that as a possibility? And, and I know there's been conversation around like, locking some things in place. We were talking a little bit about structure, footer and headers, like allowing themes or some way to lock blocks in place and maybe um, create them in a way so that they're uneditable by the client. Like, so having different permissions for blocks. What do you all think about some of this? Uh, from like from our perspective, how we, we build themes, I actually don't think I think um, global styles is a great place for these settings. And um, but we build like kind of themes for not for someone specific, but for everyone to use. So it makes sense that you can customize these things in one place. And if all themes or if all like if we all do it the same way, I think it's great and makes stuff a lot easier and um, like it's obvious that this is the place to to um, like select your main fonts for the heading for paragraphs, select your colors and things. So for us, um, I don't think it, it's too much uh, like for users to to get these things. And then also if like we are able to build block patterns or entire page templates or entire websites where all these settings are already pre selected, then it, it's not an issue, I think, at all for users to just download then these pre-selected settings. I think it would actually be awesome. And then people have a pretty cool looking website in like two minutes and then they can start customizing their things. I think that's great. And I think uh, I would like to have people have like font settings, color settings and these general um, style sheet options in one place. I think it's awesome for the way we, we create things at least. Yeah, I think um, the idea of being able to customize global styles um, from the editor is is a good one, and it's there's an unmet need there. So, like if you buy an existing theme and you want to make changes, you go to the additional CSS section, or you modify this thing yourself, or you hire someone. But that all requires some sort of level of coding ability, or you hope that your theme has the functionality built in to customize it. So, I like that the direction. Like, there's a need there. Um, but I think that the majority of people, like there's two different use cases. There is, I'm tweaking this theme to get it the way I want, which is for like the first few days you have it installed. And then there's, I'm just creating content, which is the next few years. And I don't want the, the content creation process um, to be overloaded with all these design options. Um, so it'd be nice if there was like an editing mode for WordPress. So you're customizing your theme. And then when you're done with that, put it away. Or if it's someone like me and I built a custom theme and I don't want them to be changing those things, like the theme can say, let's not edit these settings. Like the theme is ha handling this for you. So um, I think there's a lot of different um, like user types that use WordPress. Um, there's a large uh, chunk of people who are the DIY builder ones who want to tweak things. There's also the higher level ones where they're hiring a designer and developer or an agency. Um, and so these different use cases need to be addressed in different ways. But um, I think the need, need there is a need there. But I also think it's not like a every day I want to go to my website and change the font sizes and things. Yeah, I think the thing that worries me the most about it is for the super custom, super bespoke, very designed, intentional, branded experiences, which is most of what I build. 
Um, I definitely have folks who I've worked with over time who are those more DIY. I built this myself, but I can't get it quite right. Can we redo it in a way that looks right type people? Um, but for the people who are going for that more intentional designed experience, so, you know, organizations, businesses, nonprofits, et cetera, those are the people where you have to be careful about staff turnover and who knows what and who, you know, what does the what does it look like when you have multiple communications people touching it and who is able to do what and should they be able to change it and is that really okay and in the case of a lot of the websites i work on it's really not and there are you know 80 percent of the people who touch them edit the content the way that they're supposed to and move on but that 20 percent the tinkerers they will find every setting, they will change every little thing, and you end up with so much, instead of technical debt, design debt, because you've allowed tweaking in these ways that are really weird. And over time, when you have people making little tiny design changes in different sections of your site, eventually the whole thing degrades hmm. and it becomes a less professional experience. Sure. Um, sure. So that's my worry about it. However, I think if I could establish it from a global setting standpoint and then lock it down or have different tiers or some sort of permissions levels like has been mentioned, that could be helpful. I see the utility, but I also worry in the settings where I've, I mostly work, I think it gives people just a little bit too much rope in terms of what they're able to damage. I hear you. <laughs> I think an Sorry. option page would be good to have like a controlling option, like what what you allow or what you don't allow in a certain right. or somewhere well, like we, a, a plugin or whatever. I think that would solve yeah. the problem. Then. Yeah, and I've actually built themes where you have like in the customizer where you can choose like your primary color and you know your font and whatever but there's a specific use case for that. And it's not every website. From our perspective, because we are actually um, pretty excited to have like one, just only one more theme and work like only with that and with blogs together to not build like 20, 30 themes and they all have like the different options and then you have to maintain them. So for us, this is like the dream come true. Like, okay, cool, we have like, we can change the settings, like log them and then build like templates or block patterns for people and they can like switch. But this is like we build for end users to create their own right. sites. So that's a very different approach. Speaking but I think, yeah, that, settings would be cool. Speaking of that very thing, we've got a few minutes left. I wanted to ask this question and get your perspective on this as well. Could, could you see a day where a theme could be created entirely within the editor? And what would that look like? I think, yeah, pretty soon, I hope, actually. I think that would be awesome to just have one place. And I think it, yeah, we, we can aim for that. Like, for, from my, like, from the perspective, we build teams. But again, like, now, now we see it pretty clearly with us, like, three people building teams, but in all different, like, ways for different user cases. I think um, uh, for, like, the theme we build it or like how we create websites for WordPress. I don't want to even say themes anymore because it's like blogs, themes, it doesn't matter actually what you create, just the end results are like, should be great websites for, for users. So I think, yeah, I can definitely imagine that. Like it, for me, it doesn't matter if it's like, if I put together a collection of blogs or give people options of block patterns and they can put it together with some like general styles and that's it. I can totally see that. I can no. see it. I, I don't, it's, it's what we're talking about changes a lot of the roles and processes involved in the ecosystem. And one of the things that I feared a little bit with, um, 
the advent of Gutenberg in general was that it would make theming obsolete, right? Because that's where I'm specialized in. Sure. And what has ended up happening is that people actually, I feel like people need me more to sort of navigate and set things up appropriately and get things to the place where they need to be than they did before, which is interesting. Not and really. so I wonder what the roles of different people would translate to in that type of environment, because at least right now, it's actually, there's things that are much easier about building a theme with Gutenberg. And then there are things that are harder than they were before. And I've, I've noticed a difference in terms of what people are asking for from the client side, because there's just started to be a different sense of what's possible, but then what they're asking for is sometimes not possible yet because of the pace of development of core. So there's this gap, gap to bridge now, but I don't know. That's, yeah, I'm I, not sure the answer to any of that. <laughs> I think it, I agree with you. I think um, the most important part of what we do isn't writing code or designing. It's our, for my team, it's our discovery phase. It's where we understand your problems and help to find that solution. Um, and whether that is then implemented through me writing a theme with code, PHP, CSS, or I'm doing it through um, the WordPress builder and whatever it becomes, um, I don't think that will change too much of what what the where the real value comes um like you said the more power you give to the user the more um they're going to rely on experts to help them find the right solution so um, mm -hmm. a lot of people like you're lowering the barrier to build a website um, which is great but they don't have the experience of building a website and so they're not going to usually end up with something that's great at the end of the day and so there's still going to be the need for the experts the ones who have the design eye and they know who how to implement what things and perform it in scalable ways um, I don't know if um, a themeless WordPress world, I don't know how it'll look or work. I think it's technically possible. I don't know if it's um, necessary or if it's anytime um, coming anytime soon, um, but I don't think it's gonna change like the real value that like designers and developers bring, which is their, their expertise, their institutional knowledge on how to solve these problems. Really great feedback, everybody. This, uh, this panel, as impromptu as it was, was fantastic to listen to. Thank you all three of you for coming back and joining me in this hour of who knows what we we're going to have to work with. And we pulled this off really well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And for all the listeners out there, in about a uh, few minutes, we'll be coming back with, let's see. Mel Choice Duan, she's going to talk about building blocks, designing blocks. So I can't wait to watch that. We'll see everybody in a few. Thank you. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye. bye.